In this video, we're going to talk about Punnett squares and pedigrees, how to work them out, what do they mean, and what are they used for. First, we're going to talk about Punnett squares. So on the worksheet, you should be on the Punnett squares side. And on that worksheet, we are asked to cross two plants and figure out the resulting flower colors. So we're crossing two flowering plants and we're looking for the trait for a flower color. We are told from the get-go that red is a dominant color. That's just a piece of information we're given. So red is dominant. And we're also told that yellow is a recessive color here. And this is valuable information. We're going to need this information to figure out the rest of the problems here. Now, the first thing you're asked to do is to choose a letter to represent the trait or flower color. So we're looking at flower color and we're going to choose a letter to represent the trait. The letter itself doesn't matter. You're going to choose one letter though, not two different letters, a single letter to represent the entire trait. Now, I am going to choose the letter A. Why did I choose A? No particular reason. It's the first one in the alphabet. Why not? I'm trying to uh, push a point here that the letter choice makes no difference. It's arbitrary. So I'm going to choose letter A. So can someone tell me for the dominant trait, for the red, should I have a capital or a lowercase a? Hopefully, everyone said a capital A, which is correct. We assign the capital letter to the dominant trait. And for the yellow, what should our letter choice be? That one should be easy since capital is already taken. The only thing left is lowercase. So there we go. We got the first part of the worksheet done. We gave the two versions of the trait for flower color letters. So these are two, are two alleles. Remember, we call the versions of a trait, the flavors, alleles. So this is the red flavor of the trait for color, and this is the yellow flavor. Red allele, yellow allele. Okay, next we're told that both plants are true breeding, thus homozygous. Can someone tell me what homozygous means? Same. It means the same. So, this tells us that we're looking at the same letter types. So either it has to be two capital, uh, capital letters or two lowercase letters. That's what homozygous means. You've got to have identical letter types, two capital or two lowercase. And now we're asked to find the genotype of the red and the genotype of the yellow. So what are the letter combinations for the red trait and what are the letter combinations for the yellow trait if we have homozygous parents. So for red, the genotype, what are the two letters for homozygous red? Red is dominant, homozygous means the same, so we're going to have two of these. Big A, big A. Once again, dominant, capital letters, homozygous, two of the same capital letters. That's why we chose those two capital letters. And then for yellow, what is the genotype for the yellow then? If it's a homozygous parent. So again, the same letters, yellows are recessive. So what should our genotype be or the letter combination? Little a, little a. So that was the second part. In the third part, you are asked to use a Punnett square and cross these two parents. The homozygous dominant and the homozygous recessive, you're going to cross them. And for that, you need a Punnett square. So I'm going to move this up a little bit and draw my Punnett square. And 
and it's a circle. Uh, sorry, it's a square, not a circle, that has four parts divided evenly. Looks just like that. And it doesn't really matter where you put each parent. You can put this parent on the top, this parent on the left, this parent on the top, this parent on the left. We usually use top and left. We don't use bottom and right. It's just a conventional way of writing in genetics. I suppose there is no harm in doing it the other way, but it's been done this way, I guess, for a very long time. So we're going to stick to it. I'm going to put my yellow homozygous parent on the top and my red homozygous parent on the left. And this is how I do it. Two A's. So one A goes here, or one lowercase a goes here. Another lowercase a goes here. And for my homozygous dominant, the red, one big A goes here, one big A goes here. All right, now it's time to cross. Now it's time to cross. And this is how I like to do it. So first I want to look down these two squares top to the uh, bottom. And what can I put in here? What is my only choice here? What is the top parent going to donate to these squares? A lowercase a, that's all they can donate. That's all they have. So from here, the a is going to donate a little a. From here, the a, little a is going to donate a little a. Make sense? Same thing here. This a can only donate a little a. This A can only donate a little A. All right, perfect. Now that's done. Here, what can these, or what can this parent donate to these boxes? Here I can donate a big A. Here I can also only donate, donate a big A. So a big A right here, a big A right here. And from this allele, big A here, big A there. And that's it. I'm done. I crossed it. That wasn't so bad. And you'll get some practice on this uh, down the line. And you'll get plenty of practice on this when you do uh, genetics and high school biology. All right. So the next question is, and this is question two, what is the genotype of all the offspring? So the offspring are the guys inside, or I guess in this case, the flowers, inside the boxes. So here, what is the genotype or the letter combination of all of the four offspring? If you guys said big A, little a for all of them, you're absolutely correct. And that's what it is. They all are big A, little a. And that's the genotype of the offspring. And this is question two. Question three says, are the offspring homozygous or heterozygous? Well, homozygous means the same. Heterozygous means different. Homo Zygous is the same from the prefix homo. Heterozygous from the prefix hetero means different. So do I have the exact two same letters here or are these di different type of letters? They're different. It's a capital and a lower case. It's still A. I get that. They are both A's, but are they both the same type of A? No, they're not. They're different types. And this is why we say it's heterozygous. Heterozygous. It's a tough one to spell. So that's number three. Heterozygous. Not so bad so far. Let's move on to number four. I'm going to move this up a little bit. Number four asks us, what is the phenotype or color of all the offspring? So they're all heterozygous, which means they all have a capital A and a lowercase a. Now the capital A stands for red, a lowercase a stands for yellow. I have both a, a capital and a lowercase a. So what color am I going to see?
it's red for every single one of them. Because why? Why is it red for all of them? Because the capital A, the dominant allele, will mask the recessive. We'll never see the recessive. The one that has the yellow color, the red masks it. So even though they are a mix of the two, genotypically they have both letters, you do not see the yellow. You only see the red. So even though they're heterozygous, they're mixes, they're still red. You can't tell them apart from a pure red just by looking at them. Phenotypically, it's red. The color is red. All right, number five. Did the recessive color appear in the offspring? Why do you think that is? I kind of answered that already a little bit, but go ahead, think about it and give me an answer. No, no yellow. And why? Because red masks yellow. As long as the red allele is there, as long as the dominant allele is present, you will simply not see the recessive. Sad as it is, the yellow just doesn't show up. So that was number five. Any questions on what we've done so far? Next, for number six, we're asked to take the two offspring from the previous problem and cross them. What they're trying to say is they want us to take any of the two offspring here, because these are all the offspring of the original cross, the children. So they're asking us to take any two of these and cross them. Now, since they're all the same, it doesn't really matter which two we take. So we're just going to take a, a capital A, a little a, and capital A, a little a. We're going to cross them. So for number six, we are crossing capital A, little a, with capital A, little a. So they're going to get hitched, and they're going to make some babies for us, flower babies. Yay. So once again, we drew upon it square. And we are going to put one parent on the side, one parent on the bottom. Now, it really doesn't make a difference where we put each parent because they're both the same. So I'm going to say that one of them will go right here, big A, little a. The other one's going to go right here, big A, little a. Again, since they're both identical, you can't really tell the difference. So, and that's an A, not a 9. Sorry, my A's do look like 9's at times. Don't blame me. All right, now we're going to cross. Just like before, we're first going to look at the top parent. And right here, what can the top parent drop in this box? Well, it's got a capital A. That's all it can drop. So capital A here, capital A here. What about right here? What can it drop in this box? Oh, little a, that's all it can, little a. All right. What about right here? What can the left parent drop in this box? A big A, a big A, and right here, little a, little a. All right, perfect, that's done. So we crossed, that's our second Punnett square. Well done, that's number six. Number seven says, how many different genotype or letter combinations do you see in this cross? So, someone tell me. If you said three, I totally agree with you. So for number seven, oops. I have three genotypes. They are big A, little a. Sorry, big A, big A. Right there. So that one. Then I have big A, little a. That's my second one here and here. And at last I have little a, little a. So that's one. That's two. 
That's three. Three different genotypes or three different letter combinations. Number eight says, what are the different genotypes of the resulting offspring? Well, I kind of, hmm, I guess I just answered eight in here as well. Because seven just asked for how many, which was three, and eight asked for the exact one. So these are the answers for eight. So big A, big A, big A, little A, and little A, little A. Seven just asked how many. So for seven, it's three of them. For eight, these are the three. So that's seven and eight together. I guess I saved some room. All right, number nine. What are the different phenotypes of the resulting offspring? Well, that's interesting. So right here, first you have big A, big A. So this is number nine. See, my nines do look like A's. Oh, well. So big A, big A, that's the first one. What color is big A, big A? Red. Capital A is dominant. And if I have two capital alleles, of course it's going to be pure red. What else can it be? Next, I have big A, little a. What color is big A, little a? It's again red, and you can't really tell them apart. Even though that little a is there, it's being totally masked by the big A. So as if you were just to look at these two, you can't tell them apart. They're both red. So, so far, that's red. And last but not least, I have little a, little a. And what color is little a, little a? Yellow, it's back. So since lowercase a denotes the recessive and recessive is yellow, because that's the information that we got before, and recessive is shy, but since you only have recessives, you have two shy alleles, they're going to express themselves because the, the capital letter, the, the dominant, is not there to bully them. So the, the answer to number nine, what are the different phenotypes? Red and yellow. You have three chances of getting red and one chance of getting yellow. Questions on nine? And then we have number 10. Ten says, if you want all the children to have the recessive yellow color, what genotype must both parents be? So if you want 100% of the children to have a little a, little a, so what must be the genotype? Think about it while I tell you why. Has anyone thought of the answer? Well, let me show you. I'm going to go backwards. We want all the children to be a little a, little a. So I'm going to fill in my Punnett square backwards from inside out. So this is what I want all my children to be. Little a, little a's because that means they're yellow. They're, and they're all yellow. So if I'm going to get little a here, what must I have up here? A little a. What about here? If I want to have little a here, what should I have up here? little a. What about here? If I want a little a, the other little a, what should I have here? Same thing. So in order to get 100% of the children to be yellow and recessive, you have to cross two parents that are yellow recessive themselves. So if both parents are yellow and thus they're homozygous recessive, then and only then all the children are guaranteed to be yellow. Any other combination, if this was heterozygous, then you would not get all yellow. If this was dominant, then you would actually get all red. So the only chance to getting all the children to be yellow is if both parents were also yellow. So pure homozygous recessive for both parents. And that was 10. Questions on 10?
now we're going to transition to the back of the worksheet or the second side or the second page that has the pedigrees and we're going to talk about pedigrees and at the very top it says we are going to use letters to represent this trait let's use D for dominant sorry capital D for dominant and lowercase d for recessive. Um, again, I chose those letters arbitrarily. They really don't mean anything. I just chose D. So we're going to use for dominant, whatever the trait is. I don't even know what the trait is. It doesn't really matter. So for dominant, it's going to be capital D. And for recessive, it's going to be lowercase d. And it, you really probably feel like writing down a little R for the recessive. Don't. You have to stick to the same letter. Whatever letter you chose, D, X, Y, M, N, Z, W, Y, doesn't matter. Stick to the same letter. Capital becomes dominant, lowercase becomes recessive. All right, number one says, look at the pedigree to the left of this one. And which members of the family are female? And you're supposed to use the numbers, and I have the numbers there. I'm not sure if you can see those on my paper. You may be able to, but you can definitely see them on your paper. And the females are designated by what on a pedigree? Circles. So I'm going to see what the circles are, what numbers the circles have and write them down. That's a circle, so two. That's a circle, so three. That's a circle, six. That's a circle, eight. And that's a circle, 11. So those are my females, two, three, six, eight, and 11, because they're circles. And let me double check that I didn't miss any, two, three, 6, 8, 11. I think I got them all. There's 5. Yep. And that's number 1. Questions? Number 2 says, which members of the family are expressing the trait? How do I tell on the pedigree which ones are expressing the trait? I don't know what the trait is, but... If you said they're shaded in, you're absolutely correct. So I'm looking for any that are shaded in. So let's take a look here. Number one and two, this male and female. Number four, that male. Five and six, that male and female. And number nine. All of those are shaded in, thus all of them are expressing the trait. I don't know what that trait is. It really doesn't matter. We're asked to find which ones are expressing it. Those are the ones that are. And that's number two. Questions? Let's take a look at number three then. Three says, numbers one and two are parents of five, six, and seven. So one and two, right here, are the parents of five, six, and seven. So look exactly how they are positioned on the pedigree. One and two are above five, six, and seven, and there's a line coming down from one and two to five, six, and seven. So from parents to the bottom, the offspring, and there's a line that connects them. Numbers three and four are the parents of eight and nine. So three and four are the parents of eight and nine. Again, they're on the top, and there's a line that connects the parents to their children. So you're asked about the relationship between 7, 8, 10, 11, 12. So what is the relation between 7, 8, 10, 11, 12? Seven and eight are the parents of 10, 11 and 12. So 7 is the mom, 8 is the dad of the following children, 10 the boy, 11 the girl, 12 the boy. And that's the relationship that 
exists in those numbers. Questions on how I got that? Next, we're going to look at the next problem, which on my worksheet is numbered as 5. Um, so I'm going to write that down, but I mixed that, messed that up. should be 4, but I'm going to stick to my worksheet so it doesn't confuse anyone. And number 5 says, hopefully, in question 2, right here, you mark down 1 and 2 as expressing the trade. Yep, here they are, 1 and 2, they're expressing the trade. What do you think their genotypes or letter combinations are? Why? Ooh, that's a terrific question. That's probably one of the hardest questions that I've given you so far. This one is a bit of a, a brain teaser because you really have to think about it. So does anyone have a solution as to what the letter combinations of these two are, the two parents, one and two? Well, I'll tell you what they can't be. They can't both be homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. Because if they were both homozygous dominant or they were both homozygous recessive, so if they were both this, so if mom, so if number one was uh, big D, big D, and sorry, dad was that, and mom was big D, big D, then all of their children would be big Ds. That's all they have. And that means they would all express the dominant trait. Well, they're, they're not all expressing the trait. So that's out of the picture. Same thing if they were all both recessive. If number one was little d, little d, and number two was little d, little d, they would all have or not have the trait. We don't, again, again, don't know what the trait is, but if they were both homozygous recessive, then all the children would be exactly like the parents. And we know that's not, that's not the case. Number seven is not like the parents. Seven is not like one and two. And if both parents were homozygous, either dominant or recessive, the children wouldn't have a choice. They would have to be just like their parents. So we know that is not the case. So the next question is, what is the combination? So these right now, that's a no. So I'm going to put a line through there. That's a no. Next, we can take a look at this. What if number one was heterozygous? And number two was uh, homozygous dominant. If you made this cross on a Punnett square, if you made this cross on a Punnett square, then you would find out, and you are more than welcome to cross these two on a Punnett square, but you would find out that every single child would have to have a capital D in there. They would not all be homozygous. The children wouldn't all have the same genotype as their parents, but every single child would have the capital letter, which means they would either all express it or all of them would not express it. And again, we have one that is different from the parents. So again, that is not the case. So this is also out. And last but not least, uh, we can have this particular combination. Both parents are heterozygous. If you were to do this cross, which is very similar to the cross with it here, you would see that three of the children would be like the parents. One of them would not be. One of them would actually have a different expression. So that's a possibility. If both of these parents are heterozygous, then one of their children 
can have a different expression of the trait. They can be homozygous recessive. So if, let's say, the trait is dominant and one of the children is recessive, they would not express the trait. That makes sense. That could work. So, so far, that one is a winner. Number four says, based on this pedigree, and the pedigree is still right here, do you think that the trait is dominant or recessive? Use a Punnett square to, to explain your answer. Hint, look at one and two and their children. Well, we just puzzled over for quite a bit here to figure out what was the only possible combination of letters that could work for one and two. That was question number five, right? That's what question five asked us. And we figured out that they both have to be heterozygous. So they're both heterozygous. So number one is big D, little d. Number two is big D, little d. And again, we reason through this. But now we have to prove this. Why do we think that this trade is, well, first of all, we need to tell them, this is dominant or recessive. So what do you guys think, dominant or recessive? dominant without a question so you don't have to do that Punnett square um, I don't know sure why I put it there based on your reasoning in number five maybe four should have went before five I don't know but if you did the work in five number four should be easy it definitely dominant so we're gonna look at six number three is not expressing the trait that guy or that girl or that woman that female thus her genotype must be little d little d we just figured out that it's dominant which means if you are not expressing it you have to be homozygous recessive because if you have the capital letter you're going to express the trait so we know that number three can't be two big d's or big d little d she has to be little d little d and that's given to us. Based on their children, what do you think is the genotype of number four? They're asking us for this. Based on their children, what do you think is the genotype of number four? Use a Punnett square to cross number three and four. Okay, so there's two possibilities for number four. So number four can either be big D, big D, or number four can be big D, little d. Can number four be two little d's? And if he said no, why not? Okay, if that's the case, we're going to make two Punnett square crosses. I only gave you one. Herm. So we're going to make two crosses. One where we're going to cross number three, and that's the only choice for three, with this possibility for four, and then we're gonna cross the same number three with the other possibility of four, and we're gonna see what we get. So I'm gonna, you're gonna see two Punnett squares now, one for here, and then one for right there. Okay. So you guys just saw the two Punnett squares. And when we crossed these two, what were all the offspring? What did all the offspring look like? So when I crossed this and this, all my offspring were big D, little d. Do these express the trait? Are they dominant? Is this entire trait dominant? The heterozygous. It is dominant, expressing the trait. So if I were to cross these two, all the children would express the trait. This one does, but this one doesn't. 
which means the only possible combination is this. So the answer for number six is that three is little d, little d, which was given to us, but four is big D, little d. Because when you cross these two, then you have that 50% chance of having one of your kids not express the trait because they're going to be pure homozygous recessive and 50% chance of having your kid express the trait and that looks pretty accurate to me and that was number six and it did get a little bit tougher on the pedigree side as it usually does the pedigrees are the tougher genetics problems